Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Concordia's Matthew Swift and Dr. Ian Bremer. All right. Um, I got to say, this is one of my favorite parts of the summit we do every year because you come and you, you either interview a head of state or you give sort of your analysis. You put it all in great perspective. But Ian, uh, for everybody, Ian Bremer, uh, member of Concordia's Leadership Council, founder of Eurasia Group, um, and, I, and I would say one of the foremost geopolitical risk thought leaders in the world. Um, so thank you so much for coming. It's great to be back in person. I'm very happy. So let's go. Let's dive right into Europe. First time since World War II, there's a war going on on the European continent. Um, this is a particularly a particular area that you know a great deal about in terms of Ukraine and Russia. Talk a little bit about what's happening currently, what we're seeing unfold every single day. Uh, well, we're seeing the Russians uh, getting it pretty hard from Ukraine and NATO and the rest. And of course, so I will tell you, I was just with um, a friend of mine from the region leading one of the delegations who said that ultranationalism in Russia is winning. The Russians, Putin can get away with thousands of war crimes on the ground in Ukraine, but he can't lose. And that's the problem. Because of course, what Putin needs to do right now is find a way to get his country back into the international community. And that's not going to happen. So Europe is gonna take it this winter. If it's a cold winter, it's gonna be much worse for Europe. The gas will likely be cut off. But after he does that, the Europeans will be more resistant and resilient in a year and two years time where Putin will increasingly be running a large Iran, a gas station with nukes and a grudge. And I don't think people appreciate the implications of dealing with an Iran-type player, a rogue state, on the global stage. I think it's actually very dangerous, and it's going to become the principal national security threat that a lot of us, particularly that the Europeans, will have to deal with for, for decades to come, for a generation to come. Are you surprised by some of the capabilities or lack of capabilities of the Russian military? Yeah, yeah I am. Especially because they were fighting on the ground since 2014 in southeast Ukraine. So these were hardened, trained, battle-ready troops. But the 135,000 troops that the Russians put along the border, uh, clearly they were not them. Um, and the level of corruption inside the Russian military, the level of incoherence and incapacity of a lot of the generals, you've seen how many of them have been replaced, a lot of them have actually been killed in mm -hmm. combat. Um, I, look, I, I, one thing that's good that comes out of this is China, uh, which, to be very clear, has not been engaged in fighting the way the Russians or the Americans have on the ground. See what Putin said was gonna happen in Ukraine, see what happened in Ukraine, and are sharpening their pencils about what an amphibious assault against a very well-armed and trained Taiwanese army mm -hmm. would look like. And I think it makes them much less likely to engage in military escalation on what has been otherwise a very confrontational issue. Talk about this recent meeting between Xi and Putin, and it was at this, forgive me, I don't even remember, it's the Shanghai- Cooperation Organization. Cooperation Organization. SCO, yeah. And so what is their objective in that? What, so, is, what was that meeting for, and what are they trying to create? It's three billion people, it's a quarter of the global economy, and it is the principal alternative narrative to that driven by the United States and the advanced industrial democracies. So it's not usually powerful or aligned, but it matters. So you really wanna watch what they're up to. And what was so interesting, is that Putin, who back on February 4th, the last time he met Xi Jinping in person at the Beijing Olympics, they stood up and they were global buddies, they were strategically aligned, and they both would have described each other as their most important global strategic partner. Mm -hmm. It was very clear from last week's summit that that is not the way that Putin is perceived today, not just by Xi Jinping, you know, clearly saying that they are neutral on Ukraine and deeply uncomfortable with how that war is going. They don't want to be tarred with the same sanctions brush that the Russians have been tarred with. They refuse to provide military support. So where are the Russians getting external support from? Belarus, Iran, and North Korea. Okay, that is, that's not a, a high performance group, okay? Um, and, and then you've got the Indian prime minister who came and he'd been saying privately he was uncomfortable. Publicly, he goes in front of Putin and says, this is not the era of war. We don't want you to persist with this behavior. This same India that's more than happy to buy oil at a 30% discount, but's also ripping up a lot of their military agreements for, with Russian defense exporters, because why would you buy a MiG if you can't get spare parts 
going forward. So I would argue all of this is very deeply problematic. I, though I will say I was most stunned. My big takeaway from the summit mm -hmm. was when the Kyrgyz president, not someone that we frequently talk about here, um, kept Putin waiting for his bilateral. Yes, I saw that. I saw that. That is, uh, that's, that's like, let's just say that Putin is not used to that sort of thing. So, he, so Putin walks into this situation and pretty much everything he thought was going to happen, the opposite happened. Pretty much. This is going, about, I mean, I would argue this is the worst geopolitical misjudgment by any major leader on the global stage since the Soviet Union collapsed. And I'm including Bush in Iraq. I'm including like the, you know, sort of the several leaders on Afghanistan. Like this is, mm -hmm. because you've gone from Russia being being a global partner of China to being a large Iran in seven months. That's an astonishing change, and again, it's a very dangerous change. That's, that's what I think we're actually witnessing right now. And what's the future for Zelensky? I mean, he seems like a remarkable leader on the front lines, um, but what, 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 what do you see as sort of next steps in terms of governance in Ukraine? Uh, he, the fact that 27 European countries agreed unanimously to invite him into the EU as a candidate member is an astonishing thing. It never would have happened if we hadn't seen the war and the courageous response by the Ukrainians. But let's keep in mind that, I mean, they've taken tens of thousands of casualties, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians forced into filtration camps in Russia, millions of refugees. I mean, this is a lifetime event that feels like a genocide. It feels like an ethnic cleansing. Putin has said that Ukraine doesn't exist as a nation. He has said that the government is a genocidal and Nazi regime. If you are Ukraine, that fight will define you going forward. That is true whether it's Zelensky or any other leader they will ever elect de de democratically again. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that Ukraine will continue to get the same level of attention and economic and military support that they've gotten in the last six months. But I believe they will absolutely get a level of support that will allow them to continue to at least fight effectively on the ground against the Russian army. And let's keep in mind the Russians are not announcing so far uh, even a limited mobilization because it would be so unpopular on the ground inside Russia. So yes, Putin can, and he said he will do this, he's going after electricity plants and dams and all the rest. Maybe, God forbid, he can use weapons of mass destruction. He can't do things that are going to affect the military balance on the ground in Ukraine without having a hell of a lot more troops. That's not happening anytime soon. So for now, this is kind of where we are. So obviously you, you talk about a bit about the remarkable vote within the EU, yeah. all of the members, but in general, is Europe doing enough to support Ukraine? Should they be doing more? I would say that the Europeans are doing a lot in terms of the pain that they are willing to suffer to punish the Russians. So the Americans are doing more to support Ukraine. The, Pol the Polish government is a major exception there, the UK, but they're not a part of Europe anymore. The core Europeans are doing a lot more on their shoulders. Seven rounds of sanctions against Ukraine. If the Americans had to take the same economic pain this winter at the pump as the Europeans are right now, would the Americans be willing to hold together like that in support of Ukraine? I'm not so sure, right? So I, I think that when we look at Germany, at France, at Italy, when we look at you know, the Nordics, when we look at who have just, two of which have just said they want to join NATO, when we look at the EU, I think what we see is startling unity. And, and this is the big thing, is that as horrible as it has been for Ukraine, what we now see is a stronger and more expanded NATO. We see a stronger and increasingly more superstructure sovereign EU. And we see a more aligned United States geopolitically with the major allies of the G7, including even in Asia. And Putin's misjudgment actually strengthened that. So here you have this enormous crisis. And he wasn't expecting that, obviously. He certainly wasn't expecting. Look, I mean, I give Biden almost an A for everything he has done on Ukraine so far. But if you want to give Biden bad marks, the reason you give him bad marks is you say in his initial months in power, with the debacle in Afghanistan that was largely taken unilaterally and the relationship with the allies seemed more frayed, and the AUKUS announcement and the French were all miffed about that, you would say that Biden gave Putin a lot of reasons to believe that the alliance was increasingly directionless, was fragmented, and that this was the opportunity, 
especially Merkel's gone, mm -hmm. you know, you've got all this energy leverage. This is the time to go into Ukraine. Again, it was a horrible, horrible mistake, but I understand, I don't think Biden handled that well. Once it was clear that Putin was gonna invade and nothing could be done, the US leadership with its allies actually was, was quite ambitious and significant. Let's talk a little bit about the United States because I think there's so many conversations that I've been in. Uh, you travel all around the world. Uh, I travel uh, in a lot of parts of the world for Concordia. And when people talk to me about their fears or concerns of what's happening in the US, I would always come back and say, I don't think that would ever happen here. Yet, there's over the last couple of years, it seems like there's a lot of unsettling things taking place. How would you rate the, the strength of American democracy today? Uh, look, I think the United States today is the most politically dysfunctional and divided of the G7 advanced industrial democracies. That certainly was not true 30 years ago. It, the, a lot of our institutions have eroded. On the other hand, the U.S. dollar today is at 20-year highs globally. U.S. tech firms, U.S. resources, U.S. capabilities. So when we talk about the strength of American democracy, we do have to talk about both components. We have to talk about like wealth and capabilities in addition to what the government actually does and how well it will be able to affect that going forward. Um, I, I, looking forward to 2024, I think there are two separate things that are going on. One is that Trump is somewhat less likely to get the nomination now than he was six months ago. And if he gets the nomination, he is somewhat less likely to win against whoever the Democratic candidate would be, than he would have been six months ago. Is that so, the credit for the January 6th committee? I mean, what was that shift? It's, it's part of it. It's part the fact that Trump just can't get away from the, the backward looking mirror and the craziness about the election was stolen, which his base loves, but other people don't, including those that voted for him, um, and the independents. Um, and, but I think beyond that, so, so I think your baseline case is that Trump is less likely to win. But the, the narrow, tail risk of the election can be broken has gone up. Has gone up because the base is angrier, because of what's happening around Mar-a-Lago and the FBI and the DOJ and what will happen when the Republicans take the House and those investigations. The fact that in 2024 there will be a number of seated officials with oversight, direct oversight of some state elections in the United States who are active election deniers that would try to overturn an outcome if Trump lost. So again, my view in 2024, baseline is more political stability than we've had, but a tail risk of a constitutional crisis, a la 1876, that maybe was only 2% back in 2020, mm -hmm. that might be five to 20% come 2024. And, and we're gonna have to hold those somewhat contradictory thoughts in our minds over the coming two years as we watch the 2024 election play out. So, all right, so let's then go back to, you're, in, you're also very much in the media space of G Zero Media. You founded it and run G Zero Media. Talk about the media's role in a lot of this because it, you, know, you, you turn on the TV in the evening and it's like you're living in three different countries between all three cable networks. What role does the media have and do you see it getting better or do you see it getting worse over time? Uh, look, I, I see, the digital media space as being the most problematic. When you and I were kids, it was either nature or nurture that would determine our emotional dysfunction, of which we had plenty. Um, but <laughs> let me speak for myself. Um, and, and, and today, it is also algorithmic, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's literally everything about the information you get, the people that you engage with, your social mores and manners, your analytic disposition is increasingly being determined by the A versus B algorithms that you are being fed. But those A versus B algorithms are not actually being optimized for you as your human development, for you as a, as a citizen. They're being optimized for you as a product that's being sold to companies for data um, and for advertising. And as long as that is the model, authoritarian countries with access to that technology for use for the state mm -hmm will increasingly have an advantage in trending towards more stability while democracies are actually becoming more eroded. And that, that is perhaps the most disturbing takeaway that because when I wrote the book, The J-Curve back in 2006, technology was fundamentally empowering of democracies. Why? Because it was a bottom-up communications revolution. It was how we got the wall coming down. It was the Arab Spring, the colored revolutions. Because on the internet, no one knew if you were a dog. 
Well, today, that's not the way it works, right? Today, it is all top-down algorithmic, and that actually undermines democracies and strengthens authoritarian regimes if they have that technology to use. I would argue in the same way that the United States today is politically really dysfunctional but economically very robust, China today is increasingly politically consolidated mm -hmm. but economically increasingly very dysfunctional. And that dynamic between the two most powerful countries in the world and how that plays out is going to be one of the most intriguing things to follow for the next five years. So we started in Russia. We'll go all the way around the world. Let's end with a lot of coverage of Biden's interview, President Biden's interview. With 60 Minutes. Uh, yes, yeah. and talking and to some extent trying to have it both ways on Taiwan. Where does that land? It's not the first time he's done this. Yep. He said that he would defend Taiwan if they were to be invaded by China. Um, I will tell you that if you talk to Biden and ask Biden if he thinks the U.S. is defending Ukraine today, he would say yes. He would. Now, the U.S. doesn't have troops in Ukraine. The U.S. doesn't have a no-fly zone. But with the intelligence and the weapons and the training and everything else, I mean, I, I think that Biden believes that the U.S. is helping to defend Ukraine. And when he answers that question on Taiwan, that is the intention of what he is saying. Mm -hmm. But he also, at this point, well knows that the policy of strategic ambiguity, where the Americans say that you will help Taiwan defend themselves, but you will not actually send troops, is being eroded by that. And the Chinese understand that, too. And I think that Biden is comfortable with a 46% blended approval rating compared to 38 three months ago, with midterms coming up, knowing that one of the very few things that is agreed upon by Democrats and Republicans is a comparatively hawkish perspective on China, I think that Biden intended this time around to actually deliver that line. <laughs> and it was kind of funny because I posted that yesterday on Twitter when I saw it, and, and, and I said, you know, the White House is not going to walk this back. And of course, five seconds later, they walked it back. <laughs> so I put underneath, no, correction, the White House is not going to walk this back effectively, which is kind of what I was saying, but you know, fair enough. So there you go. Ian, thank you as always. It's always Thanks. great. Great to see you, man. Good to see you. Good.